Well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to our service this morning. Uh, if you picked up a bulletin sheet, let me just run through a few bits and pieces there. Uh, Andrew's on holiday for a week from yesterday. Uh, so this evening, the service will be taken by Reverend Carl McInnes uh, of the APC. Um, during the week, a few bits and pieces. Tuesday, we've got new church team leaders. Wednesday, it's a congregational prayer meeting. It's hard to believe that we're third Wednesday in January already. Uh, so this month, that is to be in Tain. So everyone comes together in Tain for the midweek meeting uh, this week. Thursday, if you're an elder, remember we've got a quick session on Thursday evening. That'll be on Zoom. Uh, this coming weekend, there is a communion in Tain. Uh, Saturday evening preparatory at half past seven and both services on Sunday. It's usually taken in-house. We do it ourselves. But we do have a guest preacher for the Saturday evening. Reverend Alex Stewart Maryborough uh, will be preaching at the Saturday evening service in Tain. Then Andrew will do the communion in the morning and I'll be preaching in the evening. And Hilton traditionally closes on the Sunday evening for the Tain communion. So there'll be no service here next Sunday evening. Uh, you join with Tain. Uh, on Monday, tomorrow, we've got the funeral of Joe McLeod. That will be in Tain Free Church, and that's going to be at 11.30, uh, going from there to Rogart. So Tain Free Church was chosen because it's, well, it's closer to Rogart rather than traveling down here and then all the way north uh, again. Um, and just one further item on the back there, discipleship, we're doing God's big picture. So it's a kind of follow-up to similar in some ways to discipleship explored it's to help us grow as christians learn more about the bible learn more about god's plan of salvation so it's open to anybody though who wants to learn more and it'll be starting at the end of the month the dates are on there we'll have a sunday afternoon session in the hall here and a monday afternoon session in the hall here and a monday evening one in tain so you can go to either end at any time uh, that suits you that's everything I need to intimate. We're going to worship God. We're going to sing to his praise from Psalm 63 on page 80. Sing Psalm's version of Psalm 63. We're going to sing verses 1 to 8 on page 80 of your psalm books. O Lord, you are my God alone. I seek your face with eagerness. My soul and body thirst for you. In this dry, weary wilderness. Psalm 63, verses 1 to 8, to God's praise.
bow our heads as we call on God's name in prayer and speak to God. Lord, we, we thank you that we can begin our service praising you uh, in song, lifting up our voices uh, to give you thanks and to praise your name. The, the, the writer of the words that we've just been singing, he, he pledged that, that he would cling to you always, that he would cling to God alone. And Lord, just as you helped him, you can help us. So we pray that we too would, would want today to stay close to you, to live in dependence on you. <coughs> he told us that he, he longed for you. He thirsted for you in a dry and weary wilderness. And Lord, we, we may be weary today. We, we may feel dry and empty spiritually. Lord, as we come to you and as we pray that you will come and meet with us, we ask that you would refresh us, Lord. Refresh us by your word. Refresh us through your spirit. Encourage us in our Christian walk. Help us, Lord, not to be bogged down by all the challenges that this world brings, all the, the fears that surround us, the anxieties that can crowd in upon us but instead help us to lift our eyes heavenward and to remember that we, we have a great God. We have a God who can do anything. So bless us young and old today. We thank you for the children with us here, Lord. We pray your blessing on them and in their schools and in their homes. And as they grow up, that they would grow up loving and following uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with young and old, we pray. Every need that we have, Lord, is known to you. So we pray that you, Lord, would draw close to us today and make yourself known to us, that we would recognize that God is in this place, that we would know that God has spoken to us today. All of these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, youngsters, will you come to the front? Can I show you what I've got today?
Turkish and you need to have Swedish and you need to have going to continue singing now, and this time we're going to sing from Psalm 86 on page 341, page 341, the Scottish Psalter version of Psalm 86. <coughs> and we're going to sing from verse 11 down to verse 15. Verse 11, teach me thy way and in thy truth, O Lord, then walk will I. Unite my heart that I thy name may fear continually. Down to verse 15, where it speaks about the pity of the Lord, which is one of the things we'll be looking at today. But thou art full of pity, Lord, verse 15, a God most gracious, long-suffering, and in thy truth and mercy plenteous. Psalm 86, verses 11 to 15, standing to sing.
We're going to read God's Word now from the Gospel according to Mark and chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And we're going to take up a reading at verse 29, reading to the end of the chapter. Mark chapter 1 and at verse 29. Let's hear God's word. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him. He was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Amen. This is the word of God. And we trust and pray that he'll follow it uh, with his own blessing. We'll bow our heads again uh, in a word of prayer. Let us pray. (coughs) Lord, we thank you for that reading that reminds us of how people were drawn to Jesus, people were attracted to Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that 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 is still the same. There is something about Jesus that draws us to him, even if we can't quite put our finger on it, even if we can't quite understand why that is the case. And while we know, Lord, that many of these crowds had followed him early in his ministry, they were doing so simply for for entertainment purposes. They liked to see the miracles. They were amazed at people being healed. We know, Lord, that when he began to teach about sin and repentance, that these people left him. They turned away. They didn't like his teaching anymore. Lord, we pray that we would not be like them. We pray that even his teaching, his promise of forgiveness, his promise of peace, all his assurances and reassurances would would draw us more and more to him in a way that is irresistible, in a way that we cannot keep away. So we pray, Lord, for the preaching of the gospel, the good news of Jesus today here, uh, in the other churches in our community, throughout our nation, and to the ends of the earth. We pray, Lord, that it would bear fruit for your glory. We thank you, Lord, that we have good news to share, and we pray that everywhere that is preached, Lord, that it will be followed with your blessing. We think this morning of the new church plant on the outskirts of Inverness at Tornagrain, as they hold their first official service. We thank you, Lord, that you've provided them with with a building there that's being leased to them. And we pray uh, for uh, Reverend Dennis McSween uh, as he leads that church plant and the folk who've left uh, Smithton Free Church to go with them there. We pray, Lord, that they will be joined by people from that 
community. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless that work and bless every place, Lord, in which the Bible is opened and preached and explained today. We want to thank, Lord, of those who are in need today, those who have a particular need of you, those who are struggling, those who are grieving, Lord. Uh, we pray for the family of Joan McLeod, we pray for Ushjan and Ascent. We commit them to you, Lord. We pray that you would help them. We pray that you'd help them in particular tomorrow. We pray for that funeral service, Lord, that it will be a means of comfort, a means of strengthening, a means of blessing. And we pray for all who grieve, Lord, whether it is recent or not. We ask that you would care for and bring comfort, Lord, to those who are struggling. We remember the sick those connected with us as a congregation who have been unwell, those who are unwell, those who are in hospitals, Lord. We know of folk at the Tain End, Duncan Fraser, who's had a heart attack, and Jeanette Crowther, Lord, who may be in for some time. We commit them to you, Lord. We pray for doctors, nurses, and all who are looking after the sick. We ask that you would help them, Lord, in, their, uh, in that calling to which you've called them and, and equip them as they care for others. We pray for Tom Wilson, Isabel Wilson's husband, who's poorly, whose family have gathered round him, Lord. We commit to them as a family to you today and ask that you would be near to them and bless them. And we pray for our community. We pray for the good of our community. We pray for the good of our nation, Lord, both economically and spiritually. We're encouraged, Lord, by news of uh, the free port of McCrumbery Firth and the promise of jobs. And Lord, we, you instruct your people to pray for the, for the good of the place where you have put them. And Lord, so we thank you for news of work and of employment and of a boost to the economy. But Lord, our, our greatest burden is for our nation spiritually and for our community spiritually. So we ask, Lord, that you would be at work among us. And we pray that we would see a turning to the Lord turning to your word, Lord, and a realization of our need of you. So bless our nation, bless our politicians who are over us, bless our world, Lord, we pray. We think of that uh, airline crash in Nepal, the families of those who've lost loved ones for the rescue effort, Lord. We ask that you be with them there. And we continue to bring before you Ukraine. And we continue, Lord, to pray for an end uh, to that conflict. These things we commit to you. We commit ourselves to you now as we continue in worship, Lord, that you would be in our midst, making yourself known to us. All these things we ask, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 145 now on page 190, page 190. Psalm 145. And at verse 8, top of the page, top of page 190. We're going to sing from verse 8 down to verse 14. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger, rich in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all that he has made and merciful to all on earth that move. Psalm 145 from verse 8 to verse 14. We'll stand to sing if you're able.
us to seek God's help, can we turn back in our Bibles to the passage that we read together in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we read again at the end of the chapter, the last three verses, verse 43 to 45. Mark chapter 1 at verse 43. So this is the leper, it's talking about Jesus sent him away with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. Go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. He stayed outside in lonely places places. Popularity and loneliness can often go hand <coughs> in hand. Madonna is one of the most successful stars of recent times, at least. She had and still has a massive following, and yet this most popular of celebrities said this. She said, there have been whole chunks of my life where I was so lonely I felt I didn't have a friend in the world. <coughs> Popularity and loneliness. Jesus was hugely popular, at least at this stage in his ministry, early on. The verse that we were reading tells us that the last verse tells us that people were flocking to him from everywhere. And yet it was that popularity that forced him to withdraw to lonely places. Popularity often brings problems. We see that in the lives of many celebrities. But Jesus was different. He may have been forced to withdraw to lonely places, but that doesn't mean that he had a sad existence. He liked these lonely places because it meant that he had time to pray. He had time alone with God, time to speak to his Father in heaven. In fact, he specifically withdrew from the crowds to make time with God. Maybe that's something you and I need to learn today, to make time alone with God. It's easy to be in company. We might love company. We might love people. We might thrive on attention, thrive on crowds. But unless we cultivate a relationship with God, we will find that there are times in our lives when we will be incredibly lonely. You know, sometimes God might bring us to a lonely place. He might cause us to be alone because he wants us to get to know him better. Times when he takes us away from our happy place takes us out of our comfort zone so that we will rely on him. There's a lot of people who came to say, I never knew that God was all I needed until God was all I had. So this morning, I'm not going to study the, the leper or his healing in any great detail. We'll make reference to it. I want instead to study Jesus. And I want us to see what makes him tick. What makes Jesus tick? That's our subject this morning. And we'll look at it under three headings. I want us to, first of all, think about his popularity. And then think about his priority. And thirdly, think about his pity. His popularity, his priority, and his pity. So his popularity, first of all. I suspect most preachers would love to have the problem that Jesus had. And that is that everywhere he went, it was mobbed. Look, for instance, at verse 32. So he's been in Simon's house. That's Simon Peter's house. And verse 32 it says, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. The whole town gathered at the door. The place 
was mobbed. And the same thing happens when you go into chapter 2. We talk about sometimes there being standing room only. There wasn't even standing room in, at, at the start of chapter 2. He's in a house in Capernaum, verse 2. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. The place was heaving. And that was always the case. Read on in chapter 2. Look at verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him. That's chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 15 at the end. For there were many who followed him. Let me just mention two more going into chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed him. And then chapter 3 and verse 20. And Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. Jesus was so popular that everywhere he went, he was harassed. Everywhere he went, he had no peace. We just read that, that they didn't even have time to eat. His family feared for his sanity. We're told there, Mark 3, verse 21, that they went to take charge of him, saying he is out of his mind. Now that situation, that popularity wasn't helped by this leper whom he's just healed in Mark chapter 1. Because Jesus asked him to keep it quiet, and instead he goes out and he blabs about it. Look at Jesus didn't, didn't just instruct him to stay quiet. He, he warned him really strongly. Look at verse 43. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. Why the strong warning? I mean, that, that's a bit odd. You think that Jesus would want people to know, want people to hear about his healings, want people to flock to him. So why is he saying don't tell? And then he didn't just do it with the leper. He did it with many, many people that he healed early on. He said, don't say a word. Don't tell. Keep it quiet. Why? Well, it's because healing was not why he came. This was not his ultimate purpose. This was not the whole story. This is just part of Jesus' ministry. He came instead to die on a cross for sinners and to rise again from the dead as evidence as proof that he was who he said he was the son of the living God and so after he's died and risen there's a change before that he's saying don't tell don't share keep it quiet but when Jesus has risen from the dead what's his instruction to his disciples go into all the world and make disciples because now that was news worth telling this Jesus had died and risen again. This Jesus didn't just come to heal physically. He came to heal spiritually. He's the healer of souls. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But at this point, we're in, early in his ministry, too much attention, too many people seeking healing or miracles meant that his work was actually curtailed. That's what we're told in verse 45 of chapter 1. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. He was forced into these lonely places. He was forced into lonely situations. His popularity led to loneliness. And you know, you think it's, it's, it's odd that these two go together. Popularity and, and loneliness. And yet they did then. And they still do now. You might know that in your own experience. You may thrive on people, on company. You might be the life and soul of the party. But when you go home, you are incredibly lonely. Another celebrity, Demi Lovato, said this. Even though you have friends and family, you can't go calling them in the middle of the night. 
when you feel so alone? Why do we feel alone? Even when we have maybe lots and lots of friends or family. Why does that happen? It is because we need the friend that is always there. We need Jesus Christ. We're made for relationship with him. And if we do not have a relationship with him, you, you, you can be lonely even in the midst of a crowd. But there is a difference between feeling lonely and being alone. Jesus had to withdraw to lonely places. But he was never a lonely person. In fact, Jesus tells us that he was actually, he tells us he was alone, but he wasn't alone. Listen to what he says to his disciples. John 16. He said, a time is coming when you will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is always with me. So just as Jesus was never alone because his because God the Father was always with him. Even in the, in the loneliest of places. So you need never be alone. Even in the most deserted circumstances you face in your life. And these, these can sometimes be in your own home. You can feel utterly lonely within your own family. But you're not alone if you have Jesus as your saviour. And as your friend, the Bible calls him the friend that stays closer than a brother. So that's our first point today, his, his popularity. Jesus had this vast crowds following him, wanting to see him doing more and more miracles. But he withdrew from the crowds. Because doing miracles was not the reason that he came. So why did he come? Well, that brings us to our second point, his priority. His popularity first. And now we're going to look at his priority, his priority. Jesus was incredibly busy. I want you to go home and read Mark 1 for yourselves and just marvel at everything that happens in that one chapter. It tells us about, well, first of all, it tells us a wee bit about John the Baptist. But then it comes to Jesus and it tells us about his baptism his temptation, well, his arrival, first of all, his baptism, his temptation, his travels, him calling his first disciples, him driving out evil spirits, healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law, healing huge numbers of people outside her house that evening, going off to spend time alone in prayer, and then healing this leper. It sounds hectic, and it was hectic. Jesus' ministry was hectic at the start. Mark he, he uses a word, a Greek word, repeatedly in chapter 1. A word that means something like immediately. It's a, a kind of fast-paced word. And he uses it 11 times in that one chapter. It's not always translated the same. It's translated in different ways. But all the times it's translated, it gives us a feeling of fast pace, fast moving. Let me just draw your attention to some of the places where it is. So, uh, verse 12. At once, so that's it, euthus is the Greek word. It's translated there as at once, so there's an immediacy. It's translated the same way in verse 18. At once they left their nets and followed him. Verse 43, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. It's this immediacy, this fast pace. It's also in verse 20 where it's translated as without delay. It's in verse 23 where it's translated as just then. It's in verse 28, translated as quickly. News about him spread quickly. It's in verse 29, as soon as. And it's in verse 42, immediately. Uh, be clean, immediately the leprosy left him. It's, it's, it's telling us things are moving all the time. Things are, it's busy, it's hectic. There was so much going on. But Jesus had to prioritize. We have to do that in our lives sometimes. We have to think, what's really important here? What, what am I going to give my time and my energy and my effort to? 
Jesus had to do that. So what was his priority? Well, he tells us, and he tells us very clearly in verse 38. So verse 35, he's going out to pray. Verse 37, they come looking for him. Verse 38, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. He makes clear that preaching is his priority. He says, that is why I came. In fact, if you look at the first thing Mark tells us that Jesus did. So Mark, he begins talking about Jesus with his baptism and his temptation. And then the start of his ministry, it's in verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Preaching. That's what it means, proclaiming. That's how he began his ministry, and that was his priority in ministry. Now, maybe you're thinking back to what I said in, uh, under the first heading of, why did he come? He, he came to die for sinners on the cross. That's true. But that was something that was done to him. We're talking here about what he had to do himself. He had to preach, and it was actually his, partly his preaching that led to his being put to death. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. So his priority was to teach, was to preach. And it's the same for those whom he calls into ministry. This must be our priority, my priority, Andrew's priority. Everybody is called to be a, 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 to be a minister. And when we preach, we are preaching the words of Jesus. See, when, when Jesus sent out, so first of all, he sent out his apostles, but then he sent out the 72. And this is what he said to them when he sent them out. It's in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 16. He said to them, he who listens to you listens to me. He who listens to you listens to me. His servants speak his words. So when we preach, Jesus speaks as long as we're preaching from, from the Word. If I just come up here and tell you some stories and entertain you with, and, and give you my own thoughts, that's different. That's not going to change anybody's life. But when I come up to you and I... I tell you what Jesus said from His Word, and I refer you to Scripture, and that's what we've just been doing. Look at this verse. Let me show you that verse. Let me read you this next verse. We're speaking the very words of Jesus. He said, if they listen to me, they are listening to me. Jesus made preaching his priority. That's why we must make preaching our priority too. And what did he preach? Well, it tells us there what he preached. Verse 50. He came proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. He said, Re the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. When you tell people to repent, most folk don't think that's good news. So how is it good news? Because there is forgiveness when we turn from our sin and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet people didn't like his message. They didn't like his teaching. They didn't like his preaching. They, they loved his miracles, but not everything else. They, were, they loved his miracles, but not his message. They liked to observe him, but not to obey him. You know, that's pretty much the same in our day. You know, people were, people were quite content to, to think about Jesus at Christmas, but not so much so come January. Last week, not the week just past, but the week before I was on holiday, went to Lewis uh, on the ferry. I love the ferry. Something always happens on a ferry. And I was in the cafeteria, which is my happy place. <laughs> and uh, there was a, a mum there who's, who had a, a little baby in a, in a high chair. And she was feeding the baby some food. And she was either making faces to him or making some noises. And this baby was giggling and giggling and giggling. And you know yourselves, there, there, there's something infectious about a baby giggling. And, you know, pretty much everybody I could see in that area of the cafeteria had a smile on their face because this baby was so attractive. 
it may be an hour later on the journey. <laughs> that baby wasn't as content. That baby was crying and screaming, and it wasn't, wasn't as attractive then. But you know, that's what happened with Jesus. People loved him as a baby. People loved him when he was entertaining, when he was doing the miracles. But not so much so when he began to teach, when he began to say, you must repent. You've got to turn from your sins. And yet, although he knew that wasn't popular, that's what Jesus prioritized. That's what he put first. He prioritized preaching over healing. But looking at his priority, there's something else that goes alongside preaching, and that is prayer. It was central to the ministry of Jesus. You, look, you see it here in verse 35. He goes to pray. But look back to verse 32. Okay, He's been at uh, Simon Peter's house. He's healed his mother-in-law. And that evening, verse 32, after sunset, so we're talking late in the evening, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many, drove out demons, and so on. It's a busy night. It's clearly a late night. You want an excuse for a long lie? Jesus had an excuse for a long lie the next day. But what do we read? Verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In his busiest days, Jesus ensured he made time for prayer. And if you read all of the Gospels, you see that he does this repeatedly. So Mark's account here, all the things that happen there, Mark's, well, Mark's in a rush, he's, he's packing it all in, he's, his, his accounts are brief. But if you look at the other Gospels, pretty much all the things that Jesus is recorded as doing in, in Mark 1, they were accompanied by prayer. So his baptism, if you read the other Gospels, he prayed at his baptism. His temptation, he prayed during his temptation. The next thing we're told here is he called his disciples. The other Gospels tell us he spent the night in prayer before he called the apostles. He preaches and he goes to pray before he preaches. If Jesus needed to pray, friends, how much more do we? How much more do we? So we're talking about his priority. Preaching accompanied by prayer. You know, if you look at the apostles, he taught them well. Because in Acts chapter 6, where they make the first disciples, they do that, the first deacons, sorry, they do that so that they can preach and pray. Let me read you one line from Acts 6. This is the apostle speaking. We will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So Jesus did this. The apostles did this. We must do this also. Priority as a ministry, preaching and prayer. But let's move on, and the last point's briefer. We've looked at, what have we looked at? We looked at his popularity, we looked at his priority, thirdly, his pity. I just want to notice very quickly that despite the fact that his priority was preaching and prayer, yet Jesus still continues to heal. He still has compassion on the sick. He shows pity to them. We've only just read verse 38, but I'm saying, this is, this is what I came to do. I came to preach. When we then read that he meets this man with leprosy, who's not sure if he'll heal him. And what are we told about Jesus? Verse 41, filled with compassion. The word means pity. He had pity on him. He had pity on this leper. And then you carry on into chapter 2 in, in Capernaum. What's happening there in the opening? He's preaching. He's got a house full. It's jam-packed as he does what he came to do, preaching. And what happens? They let this guy down through the ceiling and interrupt his sermon. What does Jesus do? He heals him while he continues to teach and to preach at the same time. So, yes, this was his priority. But Jesus had a heart that was filled with pity. Filled with pity. Seed Spurgeon, that preacher of yesteryear, he says that there's only one place in the Bible where Jesus himself tells us what his heart is like. And it's in Matthew 11 and verse 29. The verse before it is that verse where Jesus 
invites us to come to him. And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's his, that's his invitation and his great promise. He'll give us rest. But then after that comes his great reassurance, which is this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What is the heart of Jesus like? What does he tell us it's like himself? He says, I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus' heart is filled with pity. And if today you want rest from your weariness or from your loneliness, you need to come to him. You need to come to Jesus. This Jesus whose, whose popularity forced him to withdraw to lonely places. This Jesus whose priority was preaching and prayer. Yet this Jesus, the same Jesus whose heart overflows with pity for needy souls today. And he invites you. In fact, he commands you to come to him. Will you come? Lord, we thank you today for Jesus. We probably all know what it's like to be too busy, to be tired and to be weary. And we just want some me time. We just want to be away from people who make demands on us. But we thank you that Jesus never turned anyone away. Even when he went to these lonely places, the crowds followed him. And he continued to heal. But we thank you that he tells us himself what his great priority was to preach the good news. And it is good news today that if we come to Jesus, he will cleanse us of our sin. And he will be our friend and our savior forever. So draw us to him, we pray. Cleanse us anew. We ask this in his name. Amen. We will finish singing in Psalm 103 on page 370. Psalm 103, page 370. We're going to sing from verse 13 down to verse 17. Such pity as a father hath unto his children dear, like pity shows the Lord to such as worship him in fear. From verse 13 down to verse 17 of Psalm 103, to God's praise.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.